This video is supported by Chip Drop, and what better way than to tell you about Chip Drop than to do it from a site where I've just dropped some chip. So Chip Drop, which is getchipdrop.com, is a website. It's very, very simple. You basically look on a map view of your local area. You see the little pinpoints of the uh, drop sites, mostly residential drop sites. You read the description. Um, if it's something that you want to drop at and it's close by, then you click to confirm the drop site. Go drop the chip, simple as that. Um, and the best thing about chip drop is that even if you have like a local dump where you uh, can dump for free, Sometimes that can be an hour drive from your job site and sometimes you might fill up the truck more than once during the day. And if you use Chip Drop to, to have a quick look, if there's a local site nearby or somewhere closer than your regular dump site, it can save you, uh, you know, a 45 minute drive there, 45 minute drive back. And as I say, time is money. So um, Chip Drop can be really convenient. So go to getchipdrop.com. Um, and give it a try if you've not tried it before it is so 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 useful um, so try getchipdrop.com yo can you hear me i can hear you good man nice How walk <laughs> thank you yeah it was uh it was about time i did something with all these t-shirts i got yeah no doubt i've tossed a bunch of mine as well I don't see, I was wearing one of them today, that one, over your right shoulder. Oh, horses that, of, horses of change, black one. Oh, that, uh, where is it? Right shoulder, oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's, there's plenty more on this side that you can't see, but uh, yeah, there's some good ones. Do you know which one my favorite is? Uh, that one there. Oh, the Da Vinci and Man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I think that's such a cool design. I think I've still got that. Well, thanks to Ewan for that. Yeah. He did them all. And I've actually got... I don't know if you can see that. There we go. To your, to your right. Oh, is it the Coquitlam one? Yeah, but without the mouth in it. Nice. <laughs> so I uh, appreciate you doing this, Ryan, anyway. Yeah, no problem. Um, are you, how's, how's things going at the moment? Are you, are you keeping busy working and stuff? Well, yeah, actually it was pretty, I was getting concerned through February and March and things have started to pick up now. And now suddenly I feel really busy. Like I've got a lot of things on the go. Yeah. So projects that I thought were for sure going to be canceled this year are now probably going to go ahead, but modified somehow. Uh, different work safe procedures and such for COVID protection. So um, I'm a little surprised, to be honest. I thought I was going to be looking for other things, other contracts to do through the summer, but it looks like I'll be quite busy. And I, fa in fact, might have overbooked myself. I kind of won a won an RFP just this last week and now I'm wondering if I'm gonna have conflict with something else, but I think we're gonna be able to work it out. <laughs> nice. So I um the reason uh, well the reason I asked you to do this podcast and and I know I know your reaction would be like, oh, you know what why do you want me on and what you know, cause you're a, you're a humble kind of a guy. Um, but I, I actually like through, through working with you and obviously knowing you through the competitions and stuff, but through working with you on the, on the habitat job, I just, uh, it's, it probably sounds pretty strange to you, but I was, I was, um, what's the word? You kind of like it, a lot like you a lot rubbed off on me from the way that you work and watching you and the way that you just go about your work and stuff and uh, I think there's a lot of people that could could learn a lot from from you even if you don't realize it so I appreciate that I 
I, I'm, I find myself in, I mean, not that I was instructing you in any capacity in that job, you know, that was just maybe by osmosis, but I find myself in a teaching capacity sometimes and struggle to, to understand what it is that I can share for other people because, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert in any particular area, um, but understand that I'm good at what I do, but I don't always know how to articulate that or explain it or help other people to do, uh, do what I do maybe. Yeah. I think, do, do you know, I, I think it's your, just the, your, the way you, you approach, um, your work and your, your jobs and stuff. So I, it's not, um, it's not, maybe it's not even something that you can explain to others. It's just the way that your, your mind works and the way that you feel you need to approach a task that mm. would be hard to even share with somebody how you go about doing that. Cause that's not necessarily a technique that you can learn or it would be pretty hard cause it's a mental technique. Um, and, yeah. 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 That's probably fair to say, but I don't think there's anything about tree work that most people can't get good at on some capacity. I mean, everybody's got limitations, myself included, and there's aspects of tree work that I'm arguably not very good at. <clears throat> and the reasons for that are my own either disinterest in that particular field, like I'm not as stimulated by uh pest management for example like i'm miserable at, i know the basic pests and diseases uh pathogens stuff like that fungi and stuff i'm okay with but when it comes to um disease, like actual diseases or uh insects and other things like that i'm not i'm not very good <laughs> at all yeah. Yeah. because i'm not that interested in it um to be honest but uh it's probably something i should spend more time on for sure yeah I'm very, yeah, very similar indeed. Like if you do, if your interest level is not there, it, it just becomes so much harder to, to study and learn that knowledge. Like if you like, cause if you're not interested, then where's the motivation to learn, I suppose. For sure. And it also depends on the roles you find yourself in. I mean, I, in arboriculture, if I'm on the job, I'm primarily in the role of a subcontractor. Um, and so I don't find myself in a diagnostic role as often as I would like to. Um, and so those skills are obviously not very sharp because I'm not doing it on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think the, the best place to, to start is basically to learn like how did you learn about tree work before you started um and when did, did you get started and who gave you the opportunity right sure um my situation is probably different than most everybody's i would imagine uh only because of the environment that i started in i mean like a lot of people tree work wasn't something that i well, i shouldn't say like a lot of people I think it's not uncommon for tree work to just sort of ha fall in your lap. Like I didn't go out seeking uh, arboriculture. I didn't go to school for it. Um, it's just sort of something that came to me and I was all over it. As soon as I saw it and I'm like, oh yeah, I could, I could really get into this. Um, I started my working life as a lowly janitor at Butch Art Gardens. So cleaning toilets, emptying garbage cans, that sort of thing at 15 years old. And I did that for a few years. It paid well, it paid better than a lot of my friends were making. Um, but obviously that's not something I wanna do for very long. And the obvious transition was to move into the gardening department because there's a huge gardening department at Butch Arts. Um, for any of your listeners who don't know what Butch Art Gardens is, it's a floral show garden. It's not a botanical garden, but it's quite large. It's 50 acres and they have, I think, 80 gardeners in the summertime. And then there's a seasonal crew of probably 20 that, that disappear. So it might be like 55 in the winter 
and 7580 in the summer, I think. So I went away traveling as young people do and came back and applied for the gardening department, got a job, did that for a year. And one of the guys on the tree crew, there's a resident arborist crew at Butch Arts, uh, which wasn't always the case, but when I was there, it was. And somebody left on paternity leave and they needed a, somebody to fill in over the winter. Winter was the busy time for tree work at Butch Arts because you, know, you can't be running chainsaws and doing big takedowns and stuff like that in the summer when it's busy and full of tourists. So I won the job. There was a bit of a tryout, so to speak, an interview process and a few people applied. I got the job <clears throat> and did it through the winter. I definitely wouldn't say I was a natural. It was not a, an easy transition for me to begin with, that's for sure. Um, and then after the six months, I went back to my regular job. That guy came back to his job and within a month, I think he just called it quits and decided he wanted to go work in the gardening department full time. And so I got offered a full time position and then just transitioned into full time tree work. Um, what's unique about that is that there's no, there's no production, there's no dollar figure attached to any of the work I did. There was no, there were work orders, but it wasn't the same kind of thing. I mean, every job, I mean, <laughs> break, there was two 15 minute breaks and a half hour break every day at the same time, every day. <laughs> and you drop your tools, you walk down to the cafeteria and everybody piles in and you take your breaks. Like it's pretty, pretty cush, that's for sure. Um, and so in that, I had a really good mentor, Rupert Evans, um, who anybody from the Pacific Northwest who goes to the chapter competitions and things will be familiar with. And uh, he was really patient with me and, you know, taught me uh, everything I know, as he would like to say. So, yeah, just learning early on how to do things really, really well and carefully uh, and then letting the speed build after that. There was no rush to get things done in a certain time. And I, I didn't have the opportunity to learn bad habits, let's say that, early on. I yeah. probably have some bad habits now, but um, I didn't have that uh, impetus to do things quickly or rush at the start. So, uh <clears throat> compared to well compared to the majority of people in the industry you yeah you had a completely different path into your career and as as such there was yeah there was, like you say there was no production aspect whereas i think that's probably what uh well what definitely what most people have and and that that's the one thing that probably causes the most bad habits out of all or, or yeah, causes people to cut corners and maybe do things a little less safe than they should be. Um, but you, sure. yeah, but you never had that cause there was no. plenty of time to be trained and there's, there's no, nobody cracking the whip and no client to please apart from the gardens themselves, I suppose. Yeah. And I mean, not just that, not just the environment and the kind of fortunate that I was to be in that place, but my mentor, Rupert, was also very good. I mean, I, I think that I hear from a lot of people that, you know, they start maybe at a small company working for a guy who taught, taught himself and knows how to do things one way and teaches them to do that one way. And there's really, it's really insular and you're kind of working in a vacuum and even though I was in a, a big show garden Rupert encouraged me all the time to go on tree buzz and you know read the comments and learn some things and gave me material to review and you know he early on I was exposed to the broader world of arboriculture regionally and globally um, and kind of pushed to not push but like uh, suggested to take the initiative on my own and do as much reading and, and research as I could, which I was happy to do because I was pretty keen at that point and wanted to get better. And, you know, he started me low and slow with basic 
techniques and equipment, and immediately I was hungry for more. I could see that there was a better way to do what I was doing than the way than the tools I was being given, and wanted to find out all I could on how to make things easier for me. Yeah, and we we you um, aside from Rupert being your mentor, were there anybody else in like the tree crew within the gardens as well? Yeah, I mean there were at the time there were four of us in the winter time and there was one guy who would bounce back and forth so he had a seasonal position as a you know landscape gardener um and then winter time he would come over to the tree crew and work with us so there was three of us full time Rupert Chris and myself at that time and things changed over the years i was there for 3 years and over that time Chris I'm trying to think if he left before I did, uh, but Ryan Gustafson came on as a full-time uh, arborist as well. And then maybe Chris left and I left, and now it's just Ryan and Rupert uh, full-time, just two of them there at the moment. Um, so I had Chris there as well. He was definitely more advanced than me, but I, he wasn't quite as passionate about it as, as Rupert. Um, he seemed frustrated more often than not with what he was doing or the position he was in at any given time. And I thought, it really doesn't seem like he likes this all that much. <laughs> um, he did like it. Like he kind of got off on it, especially when you have big takedown days. Like, you know, he liked being up there with a big saw, blocking down big chunks of wood as much as any of us do. But I think the day-to-day -day stuff was probably not his favorite. <laughs> and so were you were you given the opportunity by um by Rupert pretty much every day to climb if you wanted to or would it, or would was he still climbing at the time and he would make you observe what he was doing and teach you that way like it was it was a gradual process that first winter that I filled in the first 6 months I don't think I climbed at all I was probably strictly a grounds person so to speak, during that time. Um, I may have done a little bit. I, mean, I remember the process. He started me super slow. I think the first time I ever roped up was just on a steep bank. I wasn't even in a tree. It was like going down a bank, getting some brush, bringing it back up. Um, I think I even, I think he even took pictures of me doing it. I have photos of me wearing a white, like front brimmed construction type heart, like hard hat an old weaver traverse maybe and you know a blake sitch on a 16 strand climbing line or something like that um but i was happy like i got to try out the gear and do some things and then and then it just sort of progressed from there you know there was a lot of deadwooding so it was kind of basic climb up with a handsaw and hand sawing deadwood out and sort of just a slow progression from there we had a bucket truck on site so we would often use that to get into the trees if we could, if it was nearby, or um, we were, some trees have fixed throw lines in them because we access them so often and they're a pain to get a throw line in. So they're probably, God, at this point, last time I went in there, I saw way more than I ever remembered. So there's probably dozens of throw lines hung up all throughout the gardens just permanently. So that they just pull a rope in and go to work in that grove or that tree. Oh, there'll be there'll be people listening to this that just be shaking their head and be like, "That's the dream job." Or you've got preset lines and all sorts. <laughs> oh yeah, but it's just it doesn't it makes sense. I mean, the yeah. Lombard poplars on the the back stunken garden are a poplar's a miserable tree to try to get up to the top of. So there's fixed lines, not fixed lines, but fixed throw lines in all of them. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, um, so. I, so you, you say you worked there for three years. So by the, by the end, well, so one, why did you make the decision to leave the gardens? Um, Cause it sounds like a pretty nice job. And also what, at what level did you feel like you were at when you left? I was okay. Two part question. Um, I'll say where I was at before I left and then why I left after that. Uh, when I left, I was a pretty capable climber. Um, I had already been to a few competitions, 
by that point and done pretty well. Um, and yeah, I was, I was capable as a climber. My skills as an arborist were, had a lot, to, long way to go. Um, you know, a lot of plant ID stuff and things like that, that, you know, I was slower to pick up on. Um, why I left was sort of two part. I mean, the job at Butch Arts was pretty cushy, but it was, you know, it was finite in its dimensionality. Like it's a great gig, but it just felt like long term it was going to feel a little, little bit stagnant. Like, yeah, it's great to have fixed throw lines, but it also is a little dull to climb the same trees every single year and take two pieces of deadwood out and then move on. Like, you know, the trees intimately, you know, by name almost. And, uh, yeah. And that kind of wash, rinse, repeat of going there, coffee break, work, coffee break, work, lunch, punch out the clock just didn't really sit well with me. Um, so I went back to school. I left and wanted to go to school for environmental science. So I did that. I applied for a, uh, a technologist program to start with. Um, so I went back to Camosun, which is a college in Victoria. Um, that was a three-year program with a work experience component. So it was a cooperative education. Finished that, realized that I didn't want to be just a technologist. I didn't I saw the job opportunities and I thought, yeah, I don't think that's going to work for me. I'm going to have to spend a lot of time working my way up through an individual company to gain the experience. So I went back to school again for another calendar year, 12 months with no breaks to complete my bachelor of science um, in environmental science. Um, so it, there's about a four year period there where I was doing a little bit of tree work, but it was sort of interspersed between studies. And, and what was the motivation to go back and, well, to go and study that? Like, was there a, was there an end goal, like career path or? Oh, I wish I could say I was one of those people that knew exactly what they wanted to do when they set out, but it, it seemed just as effective to just, I knew there was an area I wanted to go in and to just start down that path. And uh, I'd sort of figure it out as I went along. I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> so when um so when you first started Bouchard, what what year was that? That would have been two thousand three, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean I started at Bouchard in ninety five, but and so I saw the tree crew then and kind of while I was walking around the gardens as a janitor driving my Cushman full of garbage. Um but it wasn't until yeah, the early 2000s that I, st it was made up in 2001 that I started in the gardening department. Um, so I think I did four years as a custodian, took a year off to travel, came back, did the gardening thing for a couple of years. And it was sometime around 2002, 2003 that I did the uh, kind of interim position as a, as a, an arborist, crew arborist. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, so did you, so once you left and you went and started studying, have you, did you go on and just start contracting or did you, uh, did you go and work for other tree companies? Um, mm, I had a couple, so <laughs> that was, that was probably the, pe the period where I experienced what most people did at the beginning. I worked for a guy uh, I had a couple jobs um, working for smaller companies right in the year between, uh, I guess it was the year, no, in the year in between my two programs, I did some other things. I might've done a bit of tree work here and there, but I, I had some other uh, kind of unrelated jobs. I did some geophysics, geophysical surveys um, for mineral exploration and stuff. So totally different than what I'm doing now. Um, and then after university, I worked for a larger, uh, a larger tree care company for a year and a bit. Um, and in between, yeah, I worked for a smaller guy and kind of experienced that individual that a lot of people have encountered at some point in their career who just sort of does things his way. 
and you know was on a few jobs where things went down that I'm I didn't like I wanted to be as far away from as possible and um and learned a lot during that period because I had realized you know how we do things at butchers isn't necessarily the most efficient way to do things uh overall and I just hadn't learned some things there's just some skills that basic stuff that hadn't occurred to me because well for example I wasn't doing a lot of removals at butch arts I was doing a lot of climbing and I was doing a lot of pruning but there's not many trees that get taken out there so my production and removal skills developed a lot during that time just figuring out how to be efficient with that much material handling that sort of thing so what was it what was the biggest shock to go from to go from this this nice job in the gardens where there's no time pressure to then to go to a company and like like you say there's a lot of things that you wouldn't have learned that obviously you weren't working in a different client's garden every day there wasn't these time pressures that what was what was like the biggest shock that maybe you hadn't even realized that tree work would be like when you when you did that um, I think just how, uh, unrestricted and unregulated it is still is like, you know, I was doing things in an environment where I was taught, you know, what the correct way to do something is. And you sort of develop some dogma in your head that, okay, well, if that's the correct way, then that's the way that most people are or should be doing it when you get out there. And then you realize that people just do whatever the hell they want. <laughs> like, our, our, you know, an arborist with no training, an arborist, I, sh I can't even call some of them arborists, just a tree cutter can just tell somebody, a homeowner, that this is what they need to do to their tree. And they go, oh, okay, yeah, uh, sure. And they, hand over dollar bills and that person does some unspeakable thing and so that combined with safety like the difference in safety or safety culture was something that was a bit of a shock I mean I have a vivid memory of this one company that I was kind of alluding to before working on a job site and I was deadwooding some big arbutus trees and that company only had a whisper chipper, like no feed wheels, just chuck and duck, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that those things are horrifying at the best of times. But when you're, I mean, not a lot of your listeners will be familiar with what Arbutus is like, but when it when it's dry and dead, it basically turns to ceramic, like it just turns to glass. It just shatters and it's so flipping hard that just the just the branches will cut you up. And I'm locking big pieces out and we're on a government site. We're on a provincial government property. And my ground guy who's really rough around the edges is working in shorts. He did have steel toed boots on to his credit, but shorts and not even just shorts, like short shorts, like cut off, cut off jeans <laughs> and no shirt, no hearing protection, no helmet, just sunglasses on. And I don't even think he had gloves and he's feeding this chipper and just shrapnels going everywhere. And I think somebody, maybe it wasn't that day or the, the next day I caught wind of through the, my contacts on the property we were working for. Somebody else that the worked there had questioned them and said like, who are these guys? Like, are we liable for them? Because they saw Dean was his name, just doing things that even to the untrained eye looked just downright dangerous <laughs> and i'm I, I i'm just an employee i don't have the authority dean's like 15 years older than me i can't tell him what to do um he's his own boss so that was kind of like a big eye opener for me like okay this is there's nothing illegal about this like i suppose WorkSafe could have shut us down pretty easily on that one but uh but yeah, even, so even at that point like you say that you were like, he was quite a bit older than you. And this is the first like almost like production job you had like, but were you still thinking this is absolutely crazy and completely unsafe and 
Like what? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I I I had the wherewithal to see that this was not right. Like, and there's and just unnecessary. Like, I, I can sort of understand people not putting chaps on. Like. I don't agree with it, but I get it. Like there's, there's reason for that because it's less comfortable, but to not put hearing protection in when you're standing next to a chipper, like it just hurts. Like, what is the reason for that? That makes sense to someone. Um, so I, yeah, that was just me being mystified by just a person making choices. Do you feel like, do you feel like if you hadn't have, um, have had, Rupert as as a mentor in the first place say if you'd have gone to work for that company that was the first ever job you got do you feel like um as a as a young person you would have been easily led I'd have checked right out you know what sorry I'd have checked right out like at, at that point I'd be like what the hell am I doing here this is not what I want to be doing like this is crazy this is too hard this is too dangerous this is just awful I don't want any part of it <laughs> if if that's what I saw and I didn't see anything of like the bigger picture of what was going on uh, I would have had a hard time sticking with it probably yeah for sure yeah so so, so how saw. so how long did you work at that company for then I honestly don't know. It wasn't full time. It was sort of on again, off again. I did a bit of tree work for him. I also did other things for him. He did his, his bread and butter was sort of landscape installations and that sort of thing. So I would do plantings and, uh, you know, we were doing everything from installing fences to, you know, uh, contouring, like he did a mini excavator and stuff. I wasn't running that, but we were doing all kinds of other things, but tree work was definitely the most productive thing I could do for him. I mean, the other aspects I wasn't nearly as well versed in. So I wasn't as useful to him in those departments. So he, I mean, he already had a bit of a tree branch to his business because he had been a climber himself initially. And so I think having me on was sort of an excuse to keep that side of the business open. I doubt he does tree work at this point. I'm sure he, cause he didn't climb, anymore at that point his back was giving him trouble and he stopped doing it so I, i'd almost put money on the fact that he doesn't do tree work anymore he's just focusing on the landscaping and uh yard maintenance lawn mowing and stuff side of things so i don't it wasn't even that serious for him probably it was just an income source just another part to his business yeah um and and then you you went on to work for for a bigger company what was that was that a completely different view of things again? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was like, I mean, there, there was probably a few years in between those periods. Um, and then working for a large, working for big arb was kind of enlightening because I could see that, you know, there's a company and there's a structure and there's things provided like equipment and training, you know, I was seeing people get sent away to the States to, to do some training. Um, and, you know, there was in-house safety, which is something I hadn't seen since Butchart Gardens. And it, it was a little better, even though Butchart had its own safety department. You know, he was sort of, they, it was the two of them, you know, they were kind of the, the hall monitors that in everybody's eyes, like, you know, they come along with their clipboard and say, yeah, I don't think you're supposed to be using a ladder like that. Like no practical experience whatsoever, but they know the rules that are on the sheet of paper. Whereas, you know, at this larger tree care company, having a safety person who was not just there to tell you what you're doing wrong, but was there to show you how to make your job better, like how to do your job better was really nice. It was like having another not quite the same as Rupert because it wasn't that intimate, but um, it, it was like having someone uh, around to help you out. Yeah. And then, um, <clears throat> so did you, because it was a larger company, did you work with multiple people that you, that you could learn a lot more from or do, were you, do you feel like you were already, at a pretty advanced level by that point. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think in that capacity, the like I immediately got thrust into a mentorship role. Uh, it was like my first experience having things turned around on me because I got put immediately onto a crew with somebody that had had some experience. They'd been working for about a year and were well on their way, but definitely new to the game. And so I was sort of, not officially, but that was the dynamic. Um, I was definitely the more experienced person and still learning myself hugely, um, but in a role where I'm responsible and helping someone else kind of nurture their, their career and their skills. Yeah. Which is, which is fun. I mean, it was a nice change to be in that. And it, it makes you realize what you do know. I mean, you have moments, I still have moments where I think like, Oh God, I don't know what I'm doing. Like what, what am I doing here? This I'm in over my head. And it's not until you work with somebody else less experienced than you that you realize, okay, I've, I've done a lot. Like I've, I've seen a lot of things and I've done a lot of things and I can always learn something new, but this is relatively easy for me compared to how it is for this other person. Yeah. You, you I think from, from what you've said, you're very similar to me in, in the, as much as like, if you were put on the spot and said, right, you need to, you need to teach or this group of people, something like, um, on on a certain topic within our bar culture, you kind of be like, oh, well, what, what the hell am I going to teach anybody, and how do I even explain it? Whereas, when it's like, <clears throat> when it's less formal and when it's in the workplace, and you don't even maybe you're not even trying, but you have somebody less experienced and just watching them and the way that they go about things, you can, you know, it's every every few minutes you can give them a little tip. Oh, why don't you do it this way? And why don't you do it that way? And it's just so easy in that ongoing role to, to train somebody rather than trying to create a whole presentation and deliver it to try and suit, I don't know, like a, a larger audience's needs. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm good with questions. Ask me a direct question. You'll get a direct answer. Um, but I'm not good with open-ended questions like, tell me something about this area um, and leave it really open-ended. Um, when I'm asked to give, I have been asked on several occasions to give presentations on specific uh, topics. I'll be, I be uh, whatever it is, like safety or aerial rescue, I do training workshops for a few smaller tree care companies in my local area. and. I don't find that too difficult. Um, a, a good example of the opposite, you were, you were, you bore witness to this, unfortunately, along with a lot of other people was my presentation at, uh, ARC, the aero rescue competition. Um, for a lot of reasons, I walked into that without really knowing what was expected of me. I, I had a loose understanding that I was there to be an instructor, but it wasn't until maybe an hour before I presented that I was made known that I was to give a standalone talk for an interval of time. Like you're going to stand up and present on something. And I had been given a slight primer, totally different than what I ended up talking about, but it was not something I felt I could make a talk about. It was so specific and unique. And I thought I'd incorporate that later in the day somehow. So I just pulled that topic out of my ass, so to speak, uh, because it's something that I've been thinking about a lot and totally botched it. It was totally unfully formed and incomplete. And I apologize to anyone who bore witness to that because it was not, uh, I don't think an accurate representation of my public speaking skills or my presentation skills. And I fully intend, I've never, I haven't sat down and done it, but I fully intend to summarize what I was trying to say that day in a blog post so that it can be a bit more cohesive for other people to read. Um, but that's pretty abstract for anyone listening to this. They don't, they don't know what happened there, but I, 
one of the, one of those public speaking uh, nightmares, I guess you might call it. Yeah. And it's uh, probably something that the next time you come to do a public public speaking, it it's kind of there in the back of your mind or the little guy on your shoulder being like, remember last time? Oh yeah. 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 I'll, I'll be a bit more diligent asking up front about what, what's expected. So I have a bit more time to prepare. I like to, I like to be prepared. I'm not good at on the spot. I mean, troll who was another, the, the most dominant speaker there. Um, you know, he knows that content that he was being asked to speak about so intimately uh that he could have talked about it all day at length just making it up as he goes along yeah, yeah. and um so <clears throat> you you mentioned that you you started competition climbing quite early on uh while you were working for bouchard because because rupert was obviously involved with the chapter and he i mean i remember when i first started um climbing competitions in bc he was always involved he was uh, judging or uh, running events and stuff um how much do you feel like the competition climbing um improved well added to your skills out in the workplace mm. uh a lot i i don't know that i could quantify it but i would say a ton and there's probably two reasons for that. Not the one was the kind of exposure to seeing other people climbing at competitions and kind of witnessing things and seeing things that I wouldn't otherwise see or just being inspired by someone else doing something quickly. Um, the, I think the very first competition I ever went to, uh, Frank Chips was there i don't know i don't remember why he was there but he was he he is a member of the prairie chapter and he hasn't competed for a few years i don't think but he had won the prairie chapter many times done quite well at the international like i think he'd been in the masters before but i don't think he ever won it um and for a long time he held the footlock world record at that time it was 12 meters or 40 feet um and so to witness him do uh, whatever he did, I think his world record time at that time was like 11 seconds or something like that. And to see him do, you know, even a 13 second footlock was just mind bending. And to watch him do the speed climb was just like next level. Like how, how is he doing that? Like it didn't seem like it was hard for him. It just seemed effortless, like watching, you know, a, a gibbon or a monkey just swing. They don't look like they're pulling. They just look like they're elastic and somehow just bouncing upwards. <clears throat> and so that was like, oh, wow, I got a long way to go. Um, but then once you, once you dive in and you, once I found myself wanting to do better at competitions, that was sort of a driver to uh, practice and learn more and innovate on my own and it sort of pushed me to kind of accelerate my skill development more so than if I was just trying to get things done by 4 p.m. you know it it was a different thing altogether um and it was it was great to feel involved in a community I mean Rupert started the BC tree climbing uh competition which at that time was known as the Victoria tree climbing jamboree. Uh, it wasn't even anywhere else other than Victoria. And I got in involved. It had only been going for a couple years at that point, maybe two years or three years, I think prior to me. And he wanted me to be involved and I was involved in some capacity from then until very recently. So like 15 years of either set up, or competing, or both, or judging um, for that whole time. My first competition, I was too scared to do all the events because I had no, I had, I had barely been climbing and I was so nervous that I was like, I can't do these other things. There's no way. Um, and so now when I see people that have no 
very little experience, should turn up to a competition and do it all with a smile on their face. I'm just like their biggest fan, like right on. Like I couldn't do that. I didn't do that. I did the footlock and I did the speed climb because I know I could do those things, but I wasn't throw balling. I wasn't doing like work climb type stuff. And I certainly didn't know how to do an aerial rescue. So I just sat out with those events and just was there to watch for my first time out. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's always impressive when, well, when people are there for the first time, but when you hear they've only been climbing for like six months or, or something. And, and yeah. if you remember back to the time when you were in, in those shoes, it, it just seems, it just seems ridiculous that you would be able to enter a competition and, and yeah, do all those events. So hats yeah. off everybody who kind of goes in very, very green to a competition. It's, but I, but I think it's the, it's, it's probably the biggest and, and quickest learning curve you could, you could introduce to your career because you're surrounded by 30, 40 competitors and you're watching them all day long and it gives you that like drive to, to become better and see, you know, 30 different people climbing in all different manners and, and yeah. And I mean, nowadays, nowadays I'm talking like an old man uh, with like, when I first started, you know, I knew that the international tree climbing competition was a thing, but I had no means to view it unless I went there. I mean, YouTube wasn't a thing at that time. I mean, there was, the internet was existed, but speeds weren't fast enough to have online video. So all this stuff that you can watch now of people climbing at different competitions around the world is incredible. Like, you know, I could see my local climbers, but I never got a chance unless I saw one of them come to where I was. Um, I never got a chance to see that firsthand. And now you can just click away on the internet and learn as much as you want. And, and when you, like you mentioned, you, you went on to tree buzz when you first started, how, how much did you learn from that, that you weren't being taught working at Bouchard? Um, I don't want to give it too much credit because it wasn't, it wasn't a ton. It was just a resource to see other people's way of, way about things. Um, yeah, I, lis I listened to your podcast with Jamie yesterday. And so hearing him talk about tree buzz and I never, I was never on tree house sort of like filled me with nostalgia because I spent a lot of time on there reading posts and learning about new technologies and stuff like that. Um, I, Rupert was, uh, it's credit to his personality, but he was also at a stage in his career where he was looking for easier ways to do things and looking for efficiencies. And he was, I mean, I feel pretty fortunate in that within, like as soon as I was able to climb, like as soon as he had graduated me to the point where I was doing regular climbing, I was working on, where I, should, I shouldn't say working on, I was accessing trees on fixed line stationary rope, which to arborists sounds revolutionary or new, but that's not new in the grand scheme of like caving and rock climbing, like jugging lines is not, that's old technology for sure. But to tree work, it was sort of a weird thing. Um, and I was doing that from the beginning. Um, and yeah, that was, you know, moving into residential and seeing people monkey fisting and hip thrusting into trees and not throw lining a single line up and going up on even just Jumars seemed insane to me. Like, why are you not doing this? Like, this is so much easier, especially here in conifer land. Like, yeah. trying, it's one thing to throw a throw ball up into a into big deciduous tree and footlock up 50 feet and then access from there. But you can't, there's no footlocking in a Douglas fir. That just doesn't happen. Um, or a cedar. So having that ability felt like a, a massive head start in my career and progression. Um, 
and then seeing things, you know, new technologies as they come out. I mean, the rope, uh, sorry, not the rope wrench, the um, lock jack was kind of a new thing shortly after I started and Rupert got one, he bought one for the crew. And so I was climbing on a rope guide and a lock jack in 2005 when they were pretty darn rare um, and climbed on one for a couple of years and then had to give it back when I left. I still miss it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you, you mentioned about um, about the whole uh, Jumas and obviously that is in other disciplines or other fields that that is very old uh, techniques and, and it's, yeah, it seems to have caught on to the ARB world quite late because we had our, well, the industry had their own techniques of work in a tree. So it, it seemed to take a while to get in there. And it's funny when I, when I worked as an arborist in the UK, because the types of trees that we worked on weren't hardly ever like a huge height and most things were, were deciduous and it wasn't like here in the Pacific Northwest where we have these huge tall conifers all the time. Um, so I never even was exposed to uh, stationary rope, even just for access. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I worked there for six or seven years and, you know, managed to do my job at, albeit probably not the most efficient way, but I, I managed to do the job, you know, moving rope system and monkey fisting up, up the whole time. But um, yeah, like you say, out here, it's just it, some jobs and some trees I go to, I just think this, this would be impossible. Like to even to um, isolate a branch on some trees that we get to work at would be impossible. And if you managed to get f so frustrated that you settled for something less than desirable, you could, <laughs> you know, you could be putting your life at risk just because you're so frustrated that you can't isolate a branch. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it's, yeah, it does, it does seem a bit ridiculous. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. It's all environment stuff. I mean, I worked, I did a few months of work over in main continental Europe and I ended up, giving a little workshop to the crew I was working with in uh, what country would that have been Switzerland I think yeah and they didn't use any single line access either and it's not because the trees weren't big I mean one of the most impactful jobs I've done was on that crew we were doing a perimeter reduction on these huge enormous platanus along the river in Zurich and I'm trying to think the one tree I was in at one time we might have had six climbers in it and it still took almost two days to complete and I was not slow at that time I was pretty efficient but just the distances and everything was just so much and the limb walks so long and nobody was using single line they were all foot locking into these trees so after lunch you're going up 90 feet or so again and it just seemed insane to me to be <laughs> going up double rope or whatever they were doing i mean they might have been using foot ascenders on the tail of their rope or whatever but most of the time they just access trees with a ladder and then you know double system to get to the top and then work it on a moving rope system and that was perfectly suitable for 90% of what they did um, and they had their reasons why they were almost against adopting stationary rope even just for access um, primarily due to equipment inspection and cost um, and I'm curious if they ever adopted it because we my partner and I at the time who gave the workshop made a compelling argument so they could get basically we tailored them a system that they could use between crew members. They weren't like, you know, fully customized tether lengths and stuff, made it all adjustable so that they could share one system between several members of the crew and have less equipment to, to inspect and cost for maintenance. Um, so I'm curious if they ever did. I don't know that I'll ever be able to find out, but um, 
that was just a case of a different environment and it worked for them, but it certainly wouldn't work for me here. There's not a chance. Yeah. Even, even if you can do it and even if you can footlock well, access a tree, it's just, it just drains your energy so much um, that to then, yeah. to then perform the work after you've done that, you just be exhausted. Yeah. I might say, I might disagree with that point. Not if you're good at it. Um, almost nobody ever took time. I like foot locking. I, I was a, more than a little sad when it got taken away from the competition because even though I almost never did it and I don't think it's practical for tree care, I think it's bloody elegant and there's no way to get around having to be skilled at it to be fast. You can't, you can't force your way to the top. It's, you know, I've seen firsthand you put somebody with zero experience on some cam descenders and as long as there's horsepower there, they're going to get up that rope bloody quick, which is a testament to the skill being superior technology or superior technique for that kind of thing. But footlocking, there's something pure and elegant about it. And I got pretty good at it and I didn't find it that tiring because it was over quick. I would get up there. I had the power to get up quick and then I wasn't out of gas, but as soon as you spend more than 20 seconds on that rope doing it, then you start to burn out for sure. Yes. I, I agree with it looking elegant, but I, I would disagree with it in a work environment when you've got your work boots on and your, oh, yeah. your, your work harness with a few, a few extra tools than what you did have if you were in a competition. So in, in, the, in the real world, even if you're good at it, I still think it would, oh. it, it would drain your energy quite a bit. You get, you get zero disagreement from me there. I tried footlocking in Mindles since then, and it was a wretched experience. It just it burned away all the elegance and and uh, experience of the and in the and ever. in the chainsaw pants as well lifting the knees up and, and all that extra padding and, yeah, yeah and even even a small top handle chainsaw on your belt it's just not <laughs> happening no no chance um so you mentioned you mentioned um working in zurich i want to ask you what so what are i know that you've worked on a huge variety of different kind of jobs than probably uh, most arborists would have experienced. What are some of the, the real standout jobs you've worked on? Ooh, I mean, the one I just described in Zurich um, was a big one just because, you know, people from, I don't think I'm alone in North America and having a sort of reverence for the age and culture that, exists over in Europe that we don't get to enjoy. I mean, hundreds of years of establishment and boulevards that have had a chance to mature and that sort of thing. And I don't just mean the trees, but just like everything has a patina on it that we just don't have. Like it's just refined just through the sheer time that it's been able to be there. So that job was a big deal. I don't think there were any other major ones over there that had quite the same impact as that. Um, I got to meet some pretty interesting people over there and some people that I idolize, which I wouldn't have had opportunity to meet otherwise, um, which was pretty big. Um, and then, yeah, a few I've done here on the island working in some Working on Vancouver Island old growth never gets old. Um, it always feels, makes me feel small and insignificant. Um, and I've been lucky enough to do that a few times in pretty disparate capacities. I've done, you know, some pretty big removals in Cathedral Grove here. So 200 plus foot firs, uh, with a lot of mass and sometimes tight drop zones, but often they're just in the forest. Um, sometimes we're blasting to leave wildlife trees with a natural looking top or because they're unsafe to fall or piece down for whatever reason. Um, so that's always fun. Seeing trees blow up is uh, a different experience. Yeah. Um, the, the work, the work that you do, you've done in Cathedral Grove, um, all of that is like hazard, hazard stuff is it 
Yeah, yeah, it's all hazard abatement work. Um, and that, yeah, I don't, I don't wish to get started on that one. I'm, I'm not totally on board with whatever the policy and treatment plan is in there because it seems a, it seems a bit heavy handed. Um, and subsequently, because of the the openings that we've created through all the removals plus you know wind throw that's happened naturally there's some big gaps opening in that stand and wind throw is just going to continue to be a an ever accelerating problem in there um at least where people are like up on the hillside where nobody's touching is relatively natural but where we've been manipulating i mean you just drive through there and it makes me a little sick to see how much wood is on the ground. Like I look through the trees and I know, you know, some of it's from me and some of it's from people I know and some of it's just come down naturally, but it's a lot. Um, it doesn't resemble a natural forest anymore. And I've walked through a lot of natural old growth and yeah, there's, you know, there's disturbance for sure, but not to that extent. Yeah. And is it, you you mentioned obviously because of their old growth, some of the some of the the sizes of the trees are just insane. Uh, does it ever get to a point where because it's like hazard uh, and risk management, and so obviously a lot of the trees that you're working on, there's a reason that they need to be removed or or brought down or something. It have, have there many of them that you've you get really uncomfortable with once you're up there because just i suppose because of the size of them um not because of their condition which is i think what you're getting at like have i ever been well, to well condition and maybe height height plus condition <laughs> yeah yeah the height thing once you can get your once you can get your head around it and you normalize it it's irrelevant like you know rationally speaking you're not going to survive any greater a 50 foot fall if a tree collapses than you are at 250 feet like it just as soon as you can rationalize that the height becomes a non-issue um the the biggest difference happens with respect to just your normal work procedures so i get up to the top of one of those trees and i want to take the top which to an experienced arborist is a relatively routine procedure. You know, there's there's a face cut involved, there's a back cut involved. Rarely there might be wedges involved. And more often than not, you might get a pull line from your grounds person to give you a little assistance to make sure it slots into that little opening in the backyard or whatever it is. But the thought of, let alone pulling up uh, a pull line that's gonna do the job, so it's, it's got to be 230 feet long just to reach the ground in a straight line, straight down, let alone at a trajectory that's going to provide any benefit. And even if you had both of those things, you're never going to get a straight shot. Like there's so much material in the forest and other big trees that you're never going to be able to get that rope to follow a path where the person can effectively give you any help so you're, you're on your own it's basically what it comes down to you know until you get much much lower it it's all on you you got to figure it out which is kind of it's old school like you just you're going to have to do it differently you're going to have to unbalance the top by stripping out one side or you're going to have to use wedges or you're going to have to cut it over center so that it goes the way you want it to go kind of against the lean or something like that. So it just changes your perception of how you're going to, what your workflow is going to look like. It's, it's all on you. Like rig, I had to rig on the last one I did because I was in a really tight drop zone where two brand new boardwalks that they built converged and the tree was sort of at the apex of those and leaning out over the parking lot. Uh, and I had to take that tree down and there's limbs that are, 30 feet long and if I just cut it off it's just gonna come down and take out both rails of the boardwalk and just annihilate it or post right post hole right through um, and I'm thinking 
well, I kind of want to rig these, but I can't, I can't get someone on the ground to help me. Like, what are we going to do? That's going to be a ton of moving rope. There's going to be a knot in play. And what I ended up doing was just self rigging the limbs onto themselves or other limbs. I just basically had a couple slings and would just fold them in against the tree. And then I would wrap down on my, I was using an akimbo at the time and I choke off a fixed line, wrap down and then just cut it into four foot sections that I could manage and throw and work my way back up to the branch collar, cut it off, do the same with the next one. And I'd never done that before. Wow. Just like, <laughs> how am I going to solve this? It's very, very time intensive. Yeah, it was. It still only took me half a day, I think, to get it down. Um, it felt laborious, but I got really lucky with alignment of structures on the ground such that I was able to, once I got it folded vertical, I was able to just cut it and let it drop straight down. Um, and I maybe had a stub or something bounce off the boardwalk, but I didn't damage anything otherwise. Um, it looks ridiculous there now. Let me, let me preface that because I had to cut the stem in firewood sections basically for a long way until I was able to get a pull line and start pulling logs backwards into the forest. Um, so now there's like a, a giant pile of firewood in between these boardwalks. It looks like someone was <laughs> harvesting in there, but yeah, so things like that, it just, it, it forces you to have to think a little differently and, and plan what you're going to do. Rope management is different. Just getting fuel for a saw is, a task so you bring your own fuel for a fuel up if you're gonna need it yeah um, yeah i suppose you have to you have to like a, anything that would be normal on a tree job where you would have where you would just get somebody to tie something on it basically you you need to eliminate all of that because it's so much hard work to to get any extra equipment that you don't take with you yeah yeah it's a hassle so I did most of my jobs with one power saw. Um, you know, normally you would leave the ground with a top handle saw and do all your limbing work and assuming it's the removal. And then at some point you send that down and switch it out for something with a longer bar and more displacement. And on those jobs, I would just find the saw that was a happy medium. So I would take a rear handle, maybe 50, 60 cc saw, and I could still block down big wood with, but it wasn't a beast to, to spur up with and do the whole tree with that saw because the idea of lowering something down and then pulling something else up 150 feet was just totally unappetizing. You there? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. you, were, you were frozen in this pensive, <laughs> position of like he's either listening intently or <laughs> I think every, every time anybody ever freezes on the video call it always looks absolutely ridiculous yeah yeah no you look you look good you look good um as a as a as a subcontractor do you do you find yourself doing removals most of the time or do you still have like a, a nice variety of work it, it honestly depends who's hiring me. I mean, different companies have different business models and different bread and butter. So it, it really depends on who's bringing me in. But it's, I mean, in general, where I live, it's definitely greater than 50% is removal and tree work in general, I would say. Um, probably more because there's companies I'm not familiar with. And I think they probably do 70 to 80% removal business. Um, but no, I get brought in to do a lot of pruning. Um, unfortunately, I haven't touched a pair of secateurs in a couple of years, unless it's, unless it's on my own time, um, which is too bad because I really enjoy that type of work. Um, so yeah, it's, if it's something, it's generally, there's some scale issues there. It's bigger or it's more technical or something of that nature. Um, I do a lot of perimeter reductions on fir trees, for example. Like that's something that I get brought in for if it's pruning quite a bit, just because I'm perhaps more efficient at it than 
other people that they might have working for them full time. Yeah. I suppose that like, um, one of the reasons I was, I was asking about if you did removals quite often was on, on a job such as like Cathedral Grove where the trees are so large, like what do you do to, to make it uh, just to be comfortable to, to be on spurs and doing that kind of job for so long that you just like, it's not kind of crippling you to, to do it. Oh, um, I don't know. I mean, that's probably something that just comes from, uh, experience, I guess. I mean, yeah, full disclosure, even though I do a fair bit of it, standing on spurs and running a chainsaw are two of my least favorite things. That's for sure. I mean, I like chainsaws, but don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of repetitive strain injuries that come along with their use that I don't really appreciate anymore. And they're loud and all that kind of stuff. And spurs is just, it's a means to an end. It's an extremely effective tool. They are an extremely effective tool, but not the nicest thing. So you just try to do whatever you can to make it more comfortable. I mean, every opportunity I get, I'm hanging in the rope. So in between, I'll set up a system so that if I'm taking chunks down, I can lower down um, that length of my rope rather than spurring down, assuming it's not a major time waster. I mean, if it's a, if it's a 20 inch fir tree, then, oh yeah, just spur down it. It's so much faster. But when the tree is massive and the bark is made of paper mache, basically, um, and your spurs are gaffing out all the time, then yeah, any chance you get it to stay in the rope, the better for sure. Um, but there's no getting around it. It's just, it's just plain old fashioned hard work spurring up those trees. Like, there's finesse and there's technique to it, but it's never easy for anyone. Like all it takes is getting your flip line caught underneath a tiny little bark plate on the back side to just tire you out. Cause you've got to walk around and unhook it and then keep going again. I'm sure you're familiar. You've, you've done some single stem stuff. Um, it just wears you out. Uh, but using the right flip line and all that kind of stuff, taking a light rope really helps to ease the burden, but it's just, it's just a physical day. That's for sure. I mean, I left the ground on that project specifically for the couple days I was doing it. The trees that I spurred from the ground, I left with a 20 foot three quarter wire core, 200 feet of line on my hip, jet bottles, one liter jet bottle of fuel and a half liter jet bottle of oil and a full wrap 562 all hanging off my harness and it's just you just do it <laughs> you just go take breaks and just work your way up there and just take your time don't don't try to rush it because nobody's fast at that it's just you just plod your way up there and yeah it gets done before you know it yeah, I like. Do you know what, the um, one thing that I really notice about just even talking with you now and having worked with you before is that you never you never talk about speed. You always talk about efficiency, which and efficiency has become pretty much my favorite uh, my favorite topic almost over the last couple of years, and mainly because the way that I've mm. I've changed the way I climb and 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 it's all focused now on efficiencies to be and which inevitably make you quicker in the long run maybe not in that instance but in the uh, over the length of the day and um and yeah, it's so interesting to hear you like everything you say it's always about efficiency which i think is is the most important thing for for one's like lifespan or career span and like their care of their body but also like you know getting getting the job done in a timely manner on a daily basis and you know over over longer periods um, oh yeah S slow is fast and i'm i mean i don't know how long i've got in this career path but 
I'm playing the long game. That's for sure. I mean, I'm not racing to Friday. I'm racing to December. Like it's, you got to pace yourself. I, I have a good a colleague I respect who used to always say uh, 70%. That was like his motto for how much he was willing to put out. And people gave him a hard time about it because like, oh, you don't try very hard or you're not working very hard or whatever. But it was, it makes sense. And there's two ways to look at it. I mean, you you never want to be putting out your max all the time because you just, nobody can sustain that. It's just, it's impossible, physically impossible. But you, I mean, this is a whole different topic, but um, I mean, most of us don't do physical training or therapy outside of work. Um, but I've learned over time that it's pretty beneficial because if you can increase your capacity, then that 70% gets higher and higher. And it, or you can just stay at that level, what that 70% used to be, and it just becomes a lower and lower value in your overall capacity and your job just gets easier and easier and easier. So that's, I mean, that comes through efficiencies of technique and also just being physically fit as well. Um, through other means other than work. Um, but yeah, the slow is fast thing has permeated every part of my life. And I, yeah, I, I definitely, it's something that I definitely live by now. I mean, recreation wise, like it, it works for everything. I mean, listening to your talk yesterday about the akimbo, maybe I don't know if now's a good right time for it, but one of the reasons that that device works so well for me and the reason I like it so much is that I don't have the expectations of it that I might have had in the past or for other devices. Um, I don't climb at all the same, like the Ryan Murphy that people might have seen at competitions does not look the same working a tree stationary rope i'm much slower uh not in terms of productivity but i move way slower and things are so much more deliberate deliberate there's none of these competition style swings although that does still happen you know like dramatic running limb walks or anything like that everything is so much more calculated and precise um that i don't need I don't think it's not that it's not there. I, my Kimbo runs well most of the time um, for the ropes that I use it on, but I don't, I don't routinely ask that of it. So I don't notice if it's there all the time or not. I could work the tree almost the same way on a Petzl rig as I do on the Akimbo, more or less. Um, and I've done it as an experiment recently just to see if it's any different. Um, but the Akimbo is just so much more compact and user friendly for take tending slack and all that stuff that I just grab it every single time over that, over the other devices that I have. Um, but it's, it's definitely, I didn't, I was not an SRS adopter early on. That's for sure. I had tools early on to use, and they all disappointed me. And as soon as I started using Akimbo, an Akimbo, it did all the things I needed it to do to facilitate all the aspects of SRS that I saw as advantageous well. And I was like, that's it. I'm in. Yeah. Do you, did you find then, um, so after speaking with Jamie and after getting a few people's um, comments back about the Akimbo in general, it seemed like a lot of people had to wear their akimbo in for it to be smoother for them. Did you find that with your akimbo? Like you, you worked on it for a while before, before it wasn't as jerky as it is now. Um, well, I honestly don't remember. I don't remember there being a period where I was having a hard time with it. I, f I feel like it made sense right away. Um, 
and it changes all the time. It's an organic thing because you're wearing it out. And so it's never, I don't know if, I don't know if people expect consistency out of it, if they expect it to be the same performance every single day. Um, but I don't, I don't expect that of it. I mean, I'm, I'm adjusting it routinely, but that's the thing about it that makes sense to me because if I had to do that with a hitch, it's a pain in the ass. I, I feel like the days that I get on my rope and my hitch is glazed, if I'm using a rope wrench, which I hardly do anymore, or a moving rope system with a hitch, which I do still quite often, and something's wrong with it, there's not a lot of options to me to make that hitch work better because I've already tuned the length to work with the knot that I'm using. So I can't make it longer or shorter. So I have to tie a different knot with the same length hitch. And sometimes it works. Uh, I have kind of a progression that I use. I climb on a canoe most of the time. And when that canoe starts to work poorly, I can change it to a certain configuration of VT and then I get, a, I get performance back. But it's not my preference. I hate climbing on a VT. Um, because of the hockling it puts in the rope. And so I, it's, it's kind of a last resort thing that I do in the middle of a tree, basically, if, if it stops working properly. But with the akimbo, all I got to do is lanyard in and adjust one of the bollards. And at this point, I find it pretty intuitive that I, I know which one I have to adjust based on the behavior of the device. And then I'm off again. Like, I just, it's a momentary pause take it off the rope, which it does so easily, make my adjustment, clip it back on, and away I go. Um, and I don't even have written down what my adjustments are. I just put it on a different rope. I rotate it between three ropes and make the adjustments for that day and then get on with it. And do you, um, I remember speaking to you before about the akimbo and you said that, so you've got mm -hmm. the, the, or like the original version it's like the silver version um, yeah I, I refer to it as the pre-production version pre-production version yeah. Yeah, yeah so and and when i asked you at that point you said you you hadn't even tried the the production version like the blue version have you tried it now or are you still no I, I keep meaning to get my hands on one a colleague has one and his co-worker is using it right now but i keep meaning to get one and ha no that's not that's not entirely true i spent an afternoon on one and I was able to tune it in a couple of minutes for a pretty temperamental rope. I think at that time I was running it on 10 mil or something, um, which I still do with my pre-production one, even though that's outside the range that's written on it by rock exotica. Um, I run it on a 10 mil rope pretty routinely. And do you, so do you find you obviously are available to dial it in? So, um, when you just want to descend smoothly, you know, the top's not hitting the bottom and it's all kind of mm -hmm. reacting well. And it's not, you, you don't have to take a few pulls before you actually figure out where it's going to run. And yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, within reason, I, it doesn't, as I said before, I don't climb on it the same way that I used to like these smooth walking limb walks. I, I just, I don't do that as much anymore. Um, I definitely find the akimbo doesn't work as well if you don't have full body weight in it. Um, yes. So kind of get it tuned to just have my 175 pounds hanging on the device plus gear. Um, and that's when it works the best. And as soon as I unweight it and I'm moving laterally, it's definitely harder to break the device and move. But I think that's inherent to stationary rope in general. Like you've got limited friction points on a fixed line and you know, it's, it's one-to-one. -one. You, you can only tune it for one range of, of uh, friction and load effect effectively anyways. Um, and it just doesn't work as well in those others. It's wretched as a moving rope device. I, I do it in a pinch. If I'm, you know, just bailing out of something and I just want to be able to retrieve something quickly, but it's horrible. Like you're basically like pulling slack and then letting the rope run and then pulling slack and letting the rope run. It doesn't work at all. Um, but it does work. 
um, but it's not my favorite thing. To yeah, do it is an option if it's like if it's a necessity. Yeah, yeah, but it's it, it's definitely changed my game personally, especially the on off rope thing. Like being able to, I'm not someone who has adopted or spends any time messing around with um, retrievable uh, like false crotch redirects for stationary rope. Like I'm trying to think what that thing is that looks like a Teletubby head thing. Um, the metal thing. Uh, it's like a circle with two feet sticking off of it. Anyways. <laughs> You've lost oh, Yeah, I don't I don't know what it's called. It was it came out a year or two ago and people were using it as a, a way to kind of clean Oh up. like a like a blue anodized blue. Yeah, that's the thing. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what it's called, but I know what you I don't mean. I don't use those th- types of things. I I like the simplicity and the and the speed of natural. running natural redirects yeah. on a on a base at least on a base tie S, uh, SRS system. Uh, not so much with a canopy anchor just because re- retrieving that turns into a bit of a nightmare um, effort wise. And so the ability to just take the device off in two seconds and either pull a bite through or pull the whole rope through and then reconnect. Oh, hello. Oh, hi. Yeah, I lost you. Uh... There we go. Um, you, sorry, you were saying the ability yeah, to, um, uh, uh, yeah, to like pre thread pre-thread natural redirects, um, like in a large poplar cottonwood, for example. Limb walking is really not even that doable just because every twig and stuff you grab is just going to tear off. There's just nothing to get purchase on. So I'll often um, take the akimbo off, clip a throw ball on a beaner on a bite, which I can throw out through a crotch. Um, the beaner is self-centering on the bite, so I can just throw loops of slack through the crotch. The throw ball works its way down to the lowest point regardless. Um, whereas with a rope wrench system, you have to kind of do this estimate thing where you pull Right. If I lose, if I lose you one more time, I'm going to, I might try something different. If it's, see if it's my internet connection. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you, uh, gone, you, you, you know, putting a bite through. Yeah. And that carabiner and, and throw weight is self-centering. So I can throw the slack through with my loose end of the rope and it always ends up at the bottom. Whereas with a conventional system, not conventional, but like a rope wrench or a rope runner, you have to kind of pull the slack all through your system and sort of estimate how much rope you're going to need with that bite and make sure the system's at the bottom or the middle approximately so that when you throw it, pre-thread it through your natural crotch redirect, you, you get it. And it's not like hanging in free space or you have to pull a bunch of slack to get it to you. Um, so I rig that pre, pre-thread that redirect. If it's ways away from me, like if I've set up a really ambitious pre-redirect, I'll then use my traverse hook on my lanyard or another part of my climbing line, whip it out there, fish it back to myself, throw my akimbo back on midline, start to take up slack, and I'm away. I'm already got a wicked redirect and I'm moving out there and I haven't had to faff around with making sure everything's and throwing a bulky hitch and hitch climber and rope wrench set up through a crotch which might hose me at some point um it's just so much faster and so much more efficient for working things that way um but maybe that's just a style thing everybody gets something different out of srs work positioning um and that's just the things that i've uh, latched on to yeah it it definitely um like equipment like that definitely comes down to style and and you realize when when a new piece of equipment comes out how many different well the the difference in in people and how they work and what they expect from devices and some people like yourself and like Jamie almost like to like to tinker and like that that actual physical adjustment where you can make obvious changes rather than 
something like a pencil zigzag where you know it works and it 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 works as it is and there's no change in friction settings apart from the amount you pull down on it and that kind of thing and yeah and then the type of work that you do and there's there's like there's so many um you know differences in you know work type and then in individuals climbing type and all this kind of stuff it's it was it was quite it was well it was really interesting talking to jamie and it's actually it's actually made me start revisiting the akimbo a little bit and and start playing around with it just i think that happens every time i do a podcast with somebody i start like like when i when i did the podcast with jeff inman and talking about like you know climbing on two ropes it really got the juices flowing and i was like right i'm i'm gonna start trying this out and testing it and like when the yeah. right trees come along and i know that i have the time on the job to to play around with things and and it's it's great having these conversations because it is it does broaden my horizons a little bit and and make me want to try stuff yeah. rather than just sticking to the norm and going through day to day and yeah i i've really been meaning to oh what to say i get over myself i guess and be humble and try working a tree with double ropes i haven't done it yet uh, i've used two ropes in a tree on several occasions for different reasons but never under the parameters that a true twin twin rope system should be utilized and i really need to just do it and stop stop trying to be proud because i know i'm going to suck at it at, at, at the beginning and it's going to be hard um but i'm already i'm already leaning that way um one of my trepidations for moving to SRS and true SRS evangelists will probably scoff at this, but it always made me nervous um, more so than being on a moving rope system because I always felt like the margin for error was so much finer with a stationary rope system. Um, more so with a straight in, straight out device like the rope runner, um, the rope branch or an akimbo. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, a device like a, uh, an industrial descender where the rope takes a turn through the device. If, if, a, if a pencil rig starts to creep, all you gotta do is put some light tension on the brake strand and it'll stop. And you, can, you have time to lock that device off because it doesn't take any extra strength to prevent that device from creeping. Um, because there's a braking function built into the way it works. Whereas the akimbo, everything's going on inside this thing. It's a bit of a black box, right? Like there's no, there's nothing you can do as the user to help that device work better. I mean, you can push up on the arm a bit, but that's not that ergonomic. And that's not something you're going to do in the event that things go catastrophically wrong. Um, Whereas, and so I've had both things happen. I've had a single line device um, slip on me and I've had my moving rope hitch uh, move on, like slip on me and mechanical and pressing based moving rope systems. And in both of those scenarios, moving rope and stationary rope, it was less scary in the moving rope because I was able to self arrest easier by just grabbing the, the side of the, the working end of the rope because I've got a two to one mechanical advantage and I'm a pretty strong guy and I can hold myself on a fixed line, but not for very long and certainly not with any inertia to start with. And so I've had some weird things with the akimbo where I've taken precautions ahead of time and was glad I did because the potential to take a long fall is really really high it's higher i felt like so um with that kind of device i'm i'm feeling more and more inclined to double up um i use my akimbo routinely recreationally uh, as a rock climber i set it up for top rope soloing routes and just use it as a self belay the same way i do as an arborist tending on ascent with a chest harness and a tether 
except that I'm climbing the rock and it's just following me up. And I never use it on its own. I always have a secondary device like a Petzl Traxxon or a CT Roll and Lock trailing behind because even just with a bit of inertia into a fall, it does wanna slip, it does wanna move. And I've even not had one one day and thought, no, nah, I'm not gonna risk it today. So I was trying a hard route, trying some moves, and I put a, a backup knot, I put an alpine butterfly in the rope a couple feet below me, and I fully hit it. I, it slid right down when I fell off and contacted the backup knot, and I was grateful that I put it in. Wow. So, so you, you, you're thinking more about climbing twin rope because of those, um, those little, not incidents, but moments that you've had that where it's kind of creeped on you or like the, the possibility of what could happen maybe? Yeah, that, but also every other little weird thing that's happened to me in tree work that yeah. makes me realize that I'm pretty in control, but there's some, there's some element to what I'm doing that I'm fundamentally not in control of. And there's always, and, and not even beyond that, like I'm fallible, I fuck up. Yeah. And with one system, one device, one rope, one single mistake, or even a confluence of mistakes that conspire to create a failure could cost me a whole lot. So yeah, I really see having a second rope as just giving myself that margin for um, fallibility, being human. Yeah, it was. It's funny. Yesterday um, on the job, I, I don't know why this popped into my head, but this kind of comes down to this conversation right now. I was just, I was, I had like, you know, a few seconds, and I was looking up at my rope, and I was just thinking. I was just thinking about everything that we have going on and we have one rope, one harness, all like we have one of everything. Mm. And I was like in, in our industry, the amount of people that are doing this day in, day out um, and the amount of people that must not check their equipment on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, how f fewer accidents are actually, well, what we, that we hear about because everything we have is is life support and we and we only have one of those or there's it only takes one failure in the system and you're falling and it's yeah. it was it was actually a bit of a an eye opening moment and which is weird because i've been an arborist for however long like 18 years and i don't often sit there while i'm in a tree and think about my equipment in that way but it just it was pretty strange to think yeah. that we're just relying on on every link in our system being working. Yeah, working and 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 it. I suppose it comes down to how well and how strong mm -hmm. all the equipment is. Because say somebody doesn't inspect their gear for you know for years, and I imagine even though like textiles have a, a lifespan of five years there'll be arborists out there who are still working on something 25 years old and it, but, and it's still, yeah. <laughs> still supporting them. Uh, so it's, it's, yes, there's two parts. One there's it is a little, it, when you think about it, like that is it, it is a little silly that we're only expected to have one system, but obviously the gear is so well made that it, it's managing to go way beyond its life expectancy. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's getting into that branches off into a couple of different trajectories because I think the words redundancy and specifically the word redundancy gets thrown all around a lot and I think inappropriately or inaccurately because we talk about that but we're not really specifying what the failure mode is that we're being redundant for. You can have two things but are they protecting the same failure mechanism or are they just two things that would fail simultaneously um, if this one thing happened? Like it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Like, okay, we have one rope, but 
it's built to a margin that can withstand a safety factor way higher than we would ever expect to see in terms of tensile strength. Um, but then again, we work with cutting tools and we could always sever it. So um, it's, there's two ways a rope can break or sever. One is impact or load and the other is being cut. And those are com two completely separate issues that we need to address. Um, one can be at least partially addressed with work procedures, um, just how you handle your cutting tools. Um, a lot of people, you know, we talk about being tied in twice while operating a chainsaw, and there's a lot of reasons why that's advisable, not least of which is stability when you're work positioning so you don't slip and cut yourself um, if something were to happen and you'd shift off center. Um, but you're also you know, less likely to fall out of the tree. Um, I think the former is more important. I mean, we all lanyard into shit that would never support us if we cut our primary tie-in system, but we were tied in twice. The only way we would be truly tied in twice is if we had a twin rope system. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, it, there's lots of different things and some, I think there's a hierarchy of, personally I think there's a hierarchy of the redundancies that are necessary and then the other ones just become superfluous. Um, I'm on a, a group for top rope solos for rock climbing and it's, it's similar to arboriculture in that people are devising systems in order to keep themselves from falling from height with a rope and they're self belayed. So that's we're work positioning their, expecting to be caught in a fall so it's a different dynamic but it's the same level of innovation happening because there's no real device meant for that genre there is there's one or two um, but people are always looking for something better so people are coming up with different systems and people are prioritizing redundancy in different ways and there's just so much divisiveness between the members of the group like why are you doing that some people like to climb on two ropes two legs of rope some people put two devices on one rope and they're both concerned about different things happening to them while they're climbing yeah uh, i actually uh, so after listening to jeff's talk and then after speaking with him uh on the podcast i did start to play around with tw like two completely separate uh, tie-ins and I don't know if it was like the, the trees that I tried it on were just um, suited perfectly to doing it but I actually like straight away even though it f even though I thought it was going to seem so clunky and probably thinking along the same lines as you that I'm going to be terrible at this this is going to be very frustrating until you you know until you've done it plenty of times but the, I remember the first tree I tried it on, uh, or after I'd spoken to to Jeff anyway, it was a large Douglas fir, and I was bringing in some really long limbs, and and I'll say it, I wasn't I wasn't doing it like proper like sprat style where I was permanently on two, so I, I got out to a point where I needed to drop lower, and I. I just thought, well, I can take, I can unclip one system because I'm still tied in and just drop it through a little redirect. And then being redirected and having my other time point, it's going to send to me perfectly to where I wanted to be below. Yeah. And, and, and that just came to me like what in the moment when I was out there needing to be in a position, whereas if I was on one rope, I would have just, I would, I would have just made it work. Like we all do. Like yeah. you just, you just, figure a way out in the moment to do what you need to do but because i had that like additional option i was just like oh this is brilliant and then so i went down did the work i needed to do in a like super comfortable position uh ascended back up and just took my rope off again passed it back through the fork and then off i went and and that like that was the first moment i was like there's actually there's definitely something to this and then i worked the rest of the tree and the rest of the tree was i could work pretty much 
with them in tandem, like side by side, and the, there was no issue. The only the only problems I found, so I was using two rope wrenches, is obviously you have half the amount of um, weight or force on the ropes. So yeah, right. Yeah, so you have to. I, I found myself a lot unless my my full body weight was in the system. I felt myself grabbing the wrenches quite a lot, or at least I would, I would grab one and completely collapse it and almost have that as like a backup. And yeah. I, would, I would be using one as a normal system, yeah. uh, which I'm sure like, <clears throat> that, that, I mean, that still works as a system and it's still, you're still on two ropes. So it's kind of just like having a backup and you're still using one as yeah. Know, fine. But I imagine if you, if you, or when you get around to trying it, even though you 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 feel clunky, knowing you and how you think about tree work and how you plan ahead and and you're all about efficiencies, I think you'll you'll pick it up very quickly and you'll find a ton of advantages. Oh, for you. sure. I think I think I mean there's a bunch of ways to skin a cat. You can do it the way that Jeff does and the way that you tried, where you have two identical tandem systems. You could do it more rope access style where you have one that's more of a true backup where you have a device that's not intended to be work positioning but is just there and basically slack free to catch you if the other one were to fail um, that's another way to do it I, I think it's difficult for us to imagine at the moment because we have a system and equipment that's designed around we've got floating bridges that self-center to have a single working master point and then to put two devices there, it's just a cluster of gear and everything's smashing into each other. So at some point, you know, maybe it's using that spreader bridge that tree imagineers have come up with and having two pieces of hardware on there separated by a distance mm -hmm. so that they're able to function independently and without smashing into each other. Like who knows what it's going to take, but we're all, I mean, I sort of, went down this tangent with my talk at ARC, but we're such creatures of habit. We're, we're so good at learning how to do something and then going on autopilot to do that same work procedure. And we basically automate that work procedure and make it efficient and second nature. And it takes work to stop that process and try to envision how it could be different. Like you've gotten so skilled at doing this way, you go, well, why, why would I change that? Like this works so well, or I work so well in this way, it would be harder for me to do something different. But if you spend a bit of time and take a learner's mindset, you can, it doesn't take long. Your, your body's, your brain is pretty good at, at figuring it out once you go through the, that uncomfortable teething phase yeah and unfortunately i think we're all really not that keen on putting ourselves there it's it's uncomfortable to be new at something when you're used to being good at it yeah it won't like once you once you're experienced it's definitely hard when you when you know fine well that the job would be already uh, completed by now if you were doing it the way that you wanted to do it rather than spending the time to try and learn a new way. But it's, it's funny. Cause I, I remember, I, I can't remember which podcast it was on. It was on a, a, a pretty recent one, but um, I was speaking to somebody and saying, imagine the people in the UK now who are just starting out in the industry and being trained and they're, they're will only be trained on two ropes from the very beginning. And yeah. I think that they will pick it up like so it's funny. Yeah. They'll pick it up so much easier because they know they don't know any different. And if that's the way that they're taught, then they'll figure out the efficiencies from the very beginning and they won't have anything to compare it to. And, um, and one guy actually, he put a he commented on, I think on the podcast on YouTube and he said, he's just starting at one of the colleges and he, he, I mean, he doesn't know any different. So he's, he doesn't feel like it's clunky or anything. And he said, but what's funny is the instructors are obviously having a hard time teaching it because they're all arborists that climb on like one system. And for them to try and explain how to do it on two that 
when they're not even familiar is awkward. Yeah. And then for them to try and make out that it's this the that's the way it should be done and the easiest way is also well they can't say that because they would be lying because they obviously don't want to be doing it that way or most of them probably don't anyway but yeah yeah totally there's um to take that thought and go a little further with it um there's like or to go deeper into it there's knowledge and there's understanding like you can you can intellectually know how something works and and how to do it or or what how it generally functions but to, to legitimately understand it and know it intimately takes takes a little more time and experience with it um there's a video it was a whole youtube channel called smarter every day and it's one of my favorite channels this guy destin he does a lot of slow-mo stuff lately which is not that interesting but he, he delves into some really um interesting topics he's a He's an engineer, so a lot of them have a, a science and engineering component to it. Great channel, highly recommend it. But his kind of signature video is called, I think if you search Smarter Every Day Backwards Bicycle, it'll come up. And spoiler, he basically, he gets challenged to ride a bicycle that's opposite. So some engineers built one so that when you turn the handlebars to the left, the wheel turns to the right. And it's, it's a subtle difference, but a very fundamental one in difference between, and there's nothing intellectually about that that says you're, that you can't do it. Like there's nothing m mechanically or physically that says that, sh that won't work. Um, it's just a matter of learning the balance point and understanding how it works. And he had a, it took him months to learn how to do it. He learned it. But his five-year-old son figured it out in a couple sessions who had just learned how to ride a normal bicycle. And when Destin went back to trying to ride an, a, a regular bicycle, he couldn't do it. His body had unlearned how to ride a regular bicycle to learn how to ride this other one. It had automated it so heavily that he couldn't. Because you, I mean, I don't think about what I'm doing when I'm riding a bicycle. My body just understands and knows how to do it. No more than I think about where my joints are when I throw a baseball. I just, I can just do it. Um, but it, it illustrates that point so perfectly that, you know, it takes, it takes understanding to, and like experience to, to understand how to, to do something. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And that neuroplasticity that changes over time as you get older. Yeah. So it's, going to, it's actually going to be really interesting in the next few years to see the arborists develop in the UK and, and, um, and, and where, where that takes it. And if other, if then other countries will adopt that same safety standard because they see that it is possible um, yeah, because that because they'll end up making it possible because if that's the only way to do it. Yeah, well, you're. You, I'm curious. You're you're from the UK originally, and you spent a lot of time doing tree work there. Yep. As far as I know, the UK is the only country that has any kind of. I mean, it's probably something I'm not aware of, but in all the places that I've done tree work, the one thing that struck me as unilaterally the same is that it's a free for all. Pretty much the world over, tree work is unregulated as an industry. I mean, we have the ISA, but that's not a that's not a governing body. That's just a a guidelines body. Um, and the UK is the only place that has you're like ticketed for various aspects of tree work. Am I right? Yeah, um, but it still doesn't it still doesn't stop like you you could go through a whole career and never have to take these certifications if you worked for, if you were a certain type of company, like okay. the, the only time it, it ever really comes. So you, 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 do, you need to do like little like tickets or certifications for, you know, basic chainsaw use and maintenance and felling, um, using ch uh, chainsaw from a rope and harness, aerial rescue, all those, they're all, uh, certifications that you do need to do, but the only time you'll ever really be asked for them is if you work on like a construction site 
where these health and safety know that you that they're aware of it and they need to get copies of those certifications from you or okay. or if you work for a company that does like um railway work or any so any big contracts that you get but if you were just a small company wanting to do you know work in somebody's back garden no, like no. You, yeah so it's it, it, it's, better than, better than nothing, but. it's, def, it's definitely better than nothing um, yeah yeah but yeah it's not like it's not like like a sprat certification right. or something yeah yeah i i that's another i mean aside from the twin rope thing i think that the sprat thing not not the sprat thing but that kind of level of certification that has a gradated um certification level is oh man it's where it needs to go just because of that whole that <clears throat> under not understanding but that knowledge or proof of competency that comes along with that like you you can look at somebody who's ticketed at sprat level one two or three and just look up what their basic competencies are like what they've had to demonstrate to achieve that and how much time in on rope they've had to do to be able to qualify for those levels. Whereas we don't have that. I mean, aside from a few things, there's just, there's just nothing to tell me where an arborist of 15 years experience is in their skill set. Yeah. It's meaningless to me. Somebody can say, I've been doing this for 20 years. Don't care. Yeah. Like it just, it doesn't tell me anything about what you're capable of or where your knowledge lies. Yeah. Whatsoever. Yeah. And I, I really like, I like the idea of the, to keep up your Sprat certification, you have to be accountable for a certain amount of hours on rope. And then somebody, somebody who is more senior than you has to sign off to say that you are. And then that makes them accountable. So that, to hopefully not just fudge it all. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this whole series of events that means, yes, you do know all the, these certain types of knots. You do know these whole, this whole range of, of techniques and safe work practices and that kind of thing. Yeah. So even if, it, even if it was something as simple as having some kind of log workbook that had to be signed periodically to sh like for every every arborist just so that there is a, a catalog of what you've done and what you know and that kind of thing. Yeah. If we don't even have to look to industries as similar that work on rope. I mean, pilots have to maintain their hours. And if you let it lapse, you start back at square one again. I mean, you're still a pilot, you still have a pilot's license, but if you haven't flown commercial airliner in five years or whatever, you're going to have to get your hours back up before you can be certified on that equipment, or at least that's how I understand it. I mean, granted, you know, it's still a skill. It's no different than what we're doing in the sense that it's something you have to remember how to do. There's higher consequences as a pilot. If you screw up, I mean, there could be, you could have passengers or you crash a plane into other people. So there's, it's, it's way higher consequence for a mistake, but, and I'm not saying we have to go that far, but, you know, it's not, we're not inventing anything new here. Like there's other people that have industries that have done this before us and realize that we need to have some universal measure of competence. Yeah. But it's funny as well, because it's not, it's not as severe consequences as like you say to a pilot, but there still are severe consequences. Like we're yeah. still, we're still hanging our life on a, on a rope we're still p potentially taking down a tree above somebody's house and so that it's it's not you know we're still playing a risky game oh no question yeah no question um yeah and i don't know why i don't know who, who needs to take the initiative there whether it's gonna the push is gonna come from insurance companies if it's gonna come from 
government oversight com like committees, like things like WorkSafe BC, like the provincial workers' compensation uh, insurance organization, or what it's going to take um, if it's going to be federal, if it's going to be regional. But yeah, it, it almost somebody has to do it. Nobody yeah. wants to do it. Yeah. Because it's a lot of work and nobody's going to like you <laughs> for suggesting that this is some you need to do more. Um, but, you know, some aspect of it has to happen. Um, I found myself just this today and yesterday having to justify uh, my experience level um, for a consulting job. So basically having to prove that I'm competent to speak to a certain issue. And it, it was sort of infuriating because there wasn't this level of, as an arborist, I didn't have something I could point to that was recognized unilaterally and someone could go, Oh, okay. There were other, there were other certifications and not even diplomas, just like weekend courses that I could have taken that are objectively at a far lower level than the level of practical experience and knowledge that I possess, but it's recognized. It ticks a box that yeah. if you've done this, you have these basic competencies and it's more nuanced for me to say, look at my resume, look at the things I've done. I'm, I can clearly legally, I'm well, well within my knowledge and expertise to speak to this issue, but it's, it's way harder to do that on an individual person to person basis than to say I'm certified at this level. Yeah. Here's, yeah. Here it is. Yeah. I get that. And do you know, also I, um, I, th <laughs> I always have a million ideas running through my head and a while back I thought not even from a necessarily a safety point of view, but I thought how awesome it is that in, rope access you log every all the hours on rope i thought imagine if i'd have logged all the hours on rope as an arbor since i began it'd just be so interesting <laughs> and like yeah. to, to be able to actually look back and track all the jobs that you did um and maybe like even flag or highlight some of the the standout jobs that you could go back and refer to and just uh, just for um maybe personal nostalgia maybe but it'd be so interesting if i if it had been all been catalogued uh, yeah. and then i started thinking oh maybe i can make like an app like like yeah. strava so you could it was easy to like um start and finish yeah track everything and, yeah. and then realize how expensive making an app is <laughs> well, well yeah i mean as an extension of logging your hours imagine if you personally logged all the close calls you ever had because yeah. I've had more than a few. I'm sure you've had more than a few, but having it as a data set that had categories aside from it, I'd probably be horrified if I had that in front of me because what you'd want to see is a progression. You'd want to see things that happened to you early in your career and then bleed away. Like those things get phased out as you get better. But what if there was a thing that just periodically happen to you every four months or every six months through your whole career and it hasn't gone away. If we're playing a numbers game, that's a thing that's eventually going to catch you. And if you, you can easily forget about those because maybe they're minor or maybe they're not a big thing, but when you have that in your face to look at and go, yeah. wait, I keep doing this. I need to do something about this, but it's easy to forget. It's easy to just set it aside and go, well, that was a close one yeah. and then move on. And like, or even, oh, that's happened before. Uh, I won't let that happen again. And then it does. And I, I can probably think of a few things personally that I keep doing. And every time I go, whoa, like, why did you do that? Um, but I don't know. I can't quantify it. Yeah. And yeah, it, was valuable. <laughs> it is. It's funny with close calls because even if they're pretty, like if it hadn't been close, it would have been like really serious. It's, it's, it's a bit scary how quickly it can go out of your mind because nothing actually came of it. 
it was like a near miss. Uh, yeah. And is this is quite it's quite funny that this came up because I did so I did a podcast with Keith Stoner. I don't know if you if you know him or not. Uh, oh. But he was talking about. Oh yeah, I do. He was at Arc. Was he? Yeah, not? yeah, yeah. He was at Arc. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. True work. Yeah, true work. Yeah, that's it. Um, mm-hmm. He he was talking about you know like uh, work stresses and and we, we talk we kind of spoke on a whole range of different topics and then he 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 was talking about like a se- series of events if you have like a close call or if actually something does happen not to play the like the blame game but like what should be done like as a series of events series of events to not have something happen again or how it can be prevented and it just so happened that yesterday naming no names but um a grease gun went through my chipper oh um and obviously at first it i had to kind of process it and be like right (laughs) like no i I did I, i kind of i was almost like a bit kind of stunned like when i was told and it's one of those things you hear about happening all the time and then you go, Oh wait, this is, I own this equipment now. This is Yeah. Happening. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is my equipment and it could be catastrophic if something gets cracked in inside the machine that, you know, anyway, yeah. so I, all that was going through my head and I was like, God, God, like how do, like, what do I do? How do I deal with this? Because we'd had, we'd had a good day. Everything had gone really well. Um, you know, it was great weather, it was a fun job, good climbing. And then this happens. And so I took a few minutes and then I was like, right, let's kind of work through this. And so I opened the chipper up and check the blades, make sure there's no like hairline cracks and opened up the feed rollers and found there was still like a, a big part of the grease cartridge that hadn't gone through. So I fished that out, got the wire that was wrapped around the, the disc like the big the, uh, yeah. the wheel yeah. um, and then after kind of checking it all over and getting all the bits of debris out that were still left I was like right let's take some of Keith's advice here yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I said alright guys like you know I, I'm not playing the name game now I just, uh, sorry the blame game I just want to know how like what led up to this event happening yeah. and how do we go about not having that happen again? And, you know, like what are the, what are the different choices and things that we can do? And, um, cause, cause up until now the grease gun as along with the fuel and the toolbox all lives in the hopper of the chipper for for traveling from site to site, which I'm sure that's the same with a lot of tree companies. Um, the thing about the grease gun is it's black. It's quite small compared to, the fuel, the oil, the toolbox, which none of which can actually go through the feed wheels because my chipper is pretty small anyway. Um, and so we were chatting and they were like, yeah, we just, you know, we need to communicate more about who's doing what. And, and I was like, yeah, but, you know, it might not happen for another three, four years, but eventually we'll be on a job, everybody's stressed, people aren't ch- talking to each other and it'll probably happen again. Yeah. So or the, there, there won't even be the same people on the job that remember it happening yeah. the first time and this conversation. And so it'll be like a restart. Pointless. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I was like, how can I stop? So I was like, well, if the grease gun can go through the chipper, then the grease gun can't live in the hopper because it, it there's a chance it's going to happen again. Yeah. So I thought, well, I need to have an area on the chipper that the grease gun somehow can slot into and have a home or I make some kind of holder for it. So it's always on the chipper. So we always have it, but it can never go in the hopper. And and that conversation only came about because I'd spoken to Keith and he'd been saying like these processes in different, in a diff in maybe in a work situation that he'd worked at where they had this protocol of, just having a talk about safety issues that had happened or gone wrong. So, yeah, uh. yeah I, I think there's values to be learned in that because like, for example, in that situation, 
you there wasn't there wasn't any one thing that led to the grease gun going through the chipper in that there's probably two very big things one it gets stored in the hopper and two somebody forgot to take it out and so you guys have rectified it by deciding okay we're going to make it live somewhere else and so just by i mean it's a pretty basic example but by removing that one thing the other thing is much less likely to happen if it doesn't go in there every day it's less likely to end up in there for any reason um let alone having to communicate about whether you took it out or not um i made a i made a mistake uh rigging just last week probably the biggest one that's happened in a while um and i'll have a debrief with the company who it happened with at their next uh monthly meeting they have meetings every month where they can discuss both call, close calls or other things um and i didn't get hurt but i went for a pretty good ride taking a top more than i have in a long long time and i can't point to any one thing that i did wrong that led to it i probably made four mistakes and that sounds like a lot and that sounds extreme but had everything gone right i wouldn't there wouldn't have been four mistakes i wouldn't have noticed that i had made any mistakes at all because it worked out in my favor but independently there's four things i could have done differently and they all if i had done any one of them differently it probably would have led to a completely benign result where nothing would have happened um and so yeah like just to kind of go back to the twin rope thing it's it's not often that there's any one thing you know your your hitch system doesn't just evaporate suddenly it's that you were tired and thinking about something else and you tied it a little bit differently that day because it was wet and as the day went on your ropes dried out because it got hot and things started reacting differently and you didn't make an adjustment and you were running less friction like all these things conspire to create a situation that you couldn't have seen coming under reasonable circumstances um i don't know how we got there but <laughs> yeah like not blaming any one thing for like that was it, but yeah. taking time to deconstruct. Uh, so, are you um, are you are you happy to talk about what happened? That's sure. Weird. Yeah, yeah, sure. That'd be, uh, yeah, be good to hear and learn from. It's it's pretty nuanced, so it it will be hard to describe. But right. um, basically, I was doing a removal. Um, actually, I was taking over for a removal. I had been on the ground the previous day and sort of grounding and providing a little bit of mentorship for a newer climber to do his first maybe not first but a next level in removal for him lots of material it was a two stem grand fur tons of branches and debris everything had to be rigged um and sort of a there was some things for him to work out to figure it all out um and then the next day he went to a different job and i was there to rig the wood down and, but there was still one top left in one of the stems. Um, it happened to also be a double stem. It, it forked at the top. And as grand firs are, they're pretty tip heavy at the very top. Like there's a big cone load and the tops just get super, super dense. So um, I was a little concerned about the weight, um, especially considering it was two tops and they were tied together. So um, my intention was to take them at the same time so that I didn't have to go all the way up there and free them separately. Um, and I had, you know, there was plenty of strength in the stem and in the rope and the block and all the rigging to handle the weight of taking that load out, negative, negative rig it. Um, basically, I had a tough time assessing the lean or like the, the way the weight was favored because of the two tops and the way they were tied and the dog legs in Grand Furs. So I made a call to fall them in slightly an unfavorable way to the rigging, but it felt okay, uh, like it wasn't gonna be a problem. And I was also tied into the other spar so that 
making my cuts. They were close enough together that I could do all that and realize that if I knew the rig could handle it, I didn't ideally want to be on the spar because I knew regardless of what happened, I was going to get rattled a little bit. And so being on the other spar meant that I could be well away from all that and not regardless of how the, the guy on the, the ground running the ropes handled it, I was going to be out of the equation. So I felt like I was making all the things, making all the choices I could to put myself in a good situation. Um, and when it came time to do it, the wind picked up and totally screwed me in terms of the, the, the weight. It didn't want to go and it actually pinched my saw. Um, but it wasn't so heavy that I couldn't have pushed it over. So I ended up having to lanyard into that stem. So I had the power to give it some extra effort and push it over. And in the back of my head, I thought I should do this and have a hand on my clip and just unclip and swing back to the other spar, which happened to be just a couple feet higher. So I had some vertical suspension, which was nice. That's wishful thinking. When it all started to play out, I didn't have the ability to unclip that. Um, and I had slightly misjudged some of the angles and when it came over the rigging line went through, oh, I made two face cuts in the two little tops just above the fork and the block was below the fork. Um, had I just put the block two feet lower and taken it as one big pitchfork, uh, tuning fork type thing, um, I probably would have avoided this, but the rigging went sideways and then hooked through the new crotch I had just made and ran through a natural crotch. So the person on the ground had obviously adjusted friction for a block and now there was a giant natural crotch and the load just locked up. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it was a pretty heavy one. So I went for a pretty good ride. Um, and after doing this a long time and having that happen a few times, it doesn't really phase me the same way it looked to the people on the ground like I know how to ride that ride safely, not get my fingers in the way and not get hit in the chest with um, the top of it. But it was ugly for sure. There's video of it. <laughs> um, Good. Yeah. And, uh, and I damaged some rigging because the rope ran over top of my whoopee sling. Um, and luckily I had bound the slack up uh, above the part, the loaded part of the sling. So the only part that got burned was the tail um, with the rigging line, but now I have a shorter loopy sling um, and no bruises or anything to speak of, but the relatively new arborist on the ground was pretty rattled. Uh, you can tell by the cursing in her video, she thought I was coming down out of the tree and and she was a little surprised when we lowered it down and I just got on with the rest of it. Yeah. Because nothing, nothing serious had happened, but it was not ideal. That's for damn sure. So do you, did you speak with her afterwards, uh, like to reassure her that you were, that it, you were all good and what had actually happened? Or is that what you were oh. saying about? You need to like debrief a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it'll happen company-wide when that happens because other people heard about it and I can only imagine what the guy whose job, who started the removal thought. I wonder, he's a, he's a thinker and so I wonder, he's probably thinking, oh my God, that would have happened to me uh, or that, that could have happened to me or I could have got hurt. He probably... He could have easily taken it as a one-to-one. -one. Like, if I had been there, this would have happened to me also. Not taking into account that had it been him, he might have handled it differently because he might have been more nervous and gone, well, I'm not comfortable taking a top this big, so I'm going to go up and tease them apart and take it as two separate tops. When in reality, the right call would have probably been to just go a little bit bigger. I mean... We're talking an extra 60 pounds of weight mm. probably by have, by taking the whole crotch at that time. Yeah. Uh, but for whatever reason, I, I was trying to mitigate that risk by creating others. Yeah. Well, so 
thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was uh, before you even got onto that. I was going to ask you about any incidents or close calls you wanted to share to for people listening to learn from. So that was perfect. I was. Uh, yeah, that was that's one. probably the most noteworthy one. I mean, there's other things in my career, but um, yeah. nothing really that I can think of off the top of my head. Well, it's good because it's so fresh as well. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was only that was the middle of last week, I think. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I really appreciate you doing this. And I'll, I'll, uh, I won't take up any more of your evening because we've been yeah, no worries. going it's for quite already. a while, but yeah, yeah I, I really appreciate you giving up your time and, uh, and chatting with me for the benefit of other people. And yeah, yeah. Anytime. Happy to, um, speak some words from your average non-specialist armorist whatever i am <laughs> the the most efficient arborist that i've ever come across i would say oh thanks uh, well I, I, actually i'll just give you a couple of props before before i go there's yeah. a couple of things that i've that i picked up from you from the wildlife habitat job that we worked on together one is yeah. i now always have a combi spanner in my harness oh nice like you do uh, yeah. <laughs> which has actually been very useful on a, a few occasions. Um, How many times have you lost it though? It's never come out. No, no. no you, I've, I've, I've only I've only lost it if I've taken it out on the ground and then forgot to put it back in again. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah. It, it sits in the tree motion so tightly that yeah, it never comes out. Uh, I feel like I I think I after that job I moved it and in a different spot on my harness and now I lose it all the time. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, and the the other one is uh, something I don't do as common because it's more of a moving rope uh, technique. Where I, I heard you mention about if you're if you're holding your weight, don't hold your weight with your arm bent, but hold it with your arm straight. And so, okay, yeah. So now I like if ever I'm in that situation, I'll I'll always do that. And which oh, good. I, I mean, I'd never even, I'd never even thought about what I did do before, but now it, I'm like, I'm aware of what I'm doing. So I always like, if I'm holding my weight, full arm extension. So. Oh, I appreciate it. I saw Joe Harris uh, was giving a talk in Belgium when I was over there and was extolling the virtues of the spider jack and was talking about how it self feeds and you don't have to hold your arm bent while you're taking slack and here I am in the crowd going, but why would you do that? Anyways, that makes, that's like infomercial stuff with like open the closet and everything spills out onto you. Like closets are inherently that dangerous. Like I can put things in the closet and not have them fall out on me just fine. So <laughs> it's good, to, good to hear, but it's easy to do. It's easy to forget. But I mean that, that like you mentioned, I remember you mentioned when you told me about that, it, that comes from your rock climbing background is that that's, you were either you were shown that or that's just how you do it in rock climbing you you yeah your weight off of a fully extended arm rather than trying to hold the weight so straight arms yeah yeah that's yeah. intrinsic limit the number of muscles you're engaging at any given time yeah so i appreciate those things that you passed on without even knowing oh, thanks thanks <laughs> all right well, i'll uh, yeah. I, i'll let you let you enjoy your evening anyway <laughs> if you if you can find that picture of you where you said you were down the bank in the weaver harness and oh in the, <laughs> see if you can dig that one out i'll see if i can find it i know where it would have to be uh and i just moved so that shouldn't be too difficult to find so i'll see if i can find it yeah blue was it blue no green green yale xtc a spearmint the spearmint yeah and a, and a white xtc split tail i think i might even i might have even had a slack tending pulley on there a purple cmi Whoa. clipped on with a brass dog uh, leash maybe i should be so lucky at that time sounds, sounds advanced yeah <laughs> okay i'll dig it out yeah all right good talking to you ryan yeah, thank you. You too, Dan. Yeah, all right. See ya. Take care.